we've just basically encountered an alien intelligence, not in outer space, but here on Earth. We don't know much about this alien intelligence, except that it could destroy our civilization. So we should put a halt to the irresponsible deployment of this alien intelligence into our societies and regulate AI before it regulates us. This is Yuval Noah Harari, an Israeli author and history professor at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, warning against the potential dangers of the latest exciting advancements in the field of artificial intelligence based on an architecture known as neural networks. It should be noted that Professor Harari is not a computer scientist, nor a practitioner in the field of artificial intelligence, but he is what is known as a futurist. Effectively, a philosopher that begins his journey with a set of unproven assumptions as his map, namely atheism, Darwinism, and a universe several billions of years old, and then uses that map to walk as far into the distance as possible to predict the future trajectory of human society. And according to Professor Harari's map, coupled with the blistering pace of AI research, the future may be potentially quite bleak. Welcome to Modern Dogma, a Christian considering today's ideas. Harari is joined in his concerns by other futurist philosophers like Ray Kurzweil, who is admittedly a legitimate computer scientist and inventor, but Kurzweil, based on a similar atheistic map, considers a phenomenon known as Moore's Law, which is an observation from the 1960s that computing power tends to grow exponentially with time, and by extrapolating this observation into the far future, in his 2005 book, the singularity is near, Kurzweil prophesies mankind will create a machine mind more intelligent than its collective self by 2045, a monumental event called the technological singularity. This event is dubbed a singularity because, just like physical singularities or black holes, the state of the world beyond the event horizon of the invention of a superintelligence will be purportedly unknowable and likely radically transformative of the human condition. How transformative? Let's hear from entrepreneur and another futurist, Elon Musk. Uh, now, what happens when something uh, vastly smarter than the smartest person uh, comes along in silicon form? It's called the singularity. It's you know, a singularity like a black hole because yes. you, you don't know what happens after that. It's hard to predict. So I think we should be cautious with uh, AI um, and we should, I think there should be some government oversight uh, because it affects the, it, it's a danger to the public. It has the potential of civilizational destruction. So needless to say, there is presently an undercurrent of great anxiety in the culture, and it all centers on a technology that I submit has been poorly named artificial intelligence. The term artificial intelligence was coined by one of the field's pioneers, John McCarthy, in 1956, who was pursuing an ambitious dream first sought by mathematician Alan Turing 20 years ago to create a machine that thinks. Now, to be as fair as possible, in the case of Turing, he much preferred what he thought was a more precise objective of creating a machine that has a 70% chance of passing what he dubbed the imitation game or the Turing test. Nevertheless, Turing then goes on to say, quote, I believe that at the end of the century, the use of words and general educated opinion will have altered so much that one will be able to speak of machines thinking without expecting to be contradicted." End quote. Now, the first important point to understand is that this goal to create a computer that thinks, perhaps we can specify that to mean a computer that demonstrates understanding and intelligence equivalent to a human being, which is effectively to be God and create life made in the image of man, 
is no longer remotely relevant to the actual scientific work being performed by researchers in the field still called AI today. Even though the 1956 term invented by McCarthy has stuck around through the decades, no actual scientist in the present day designing an AI algorithm aims for the original objectives of men like Alan Turing, John McCarthy, or Marvin Minsky. And for the Christian, we understand that this is for the simple reason that it cannot be done. As mankind's knowledge of the human brain and the amorphous and extremely complex concept of intelligence continues to increase through years of research, what men are discovering is just how impossibly complicated and miraculous the human mind actually is. What John McCarthy infamously thought he could accomplish in a single summer with a small group of computer experts in his words, a significant advance toward the creation of a machine indistinguishable from a thinking human being, nearly a century later, we now understand is so far beyond our reach, all but the fringes of the contemporary AI community have utterly given up attempting. And so today, there is a distinguishing between what is called strong or general AI and weak or narrow AI. Strong or general AI, also sometimes called AGI for artificial general intelligence, are synonyms that define computers that have intelligence equivalent to a human, which includes, but I would note, very importantly, is not limited to, Abilities like perceiving your environment, the ability to learn, problem solving, planning, reasoning, and natural language understanding. So, once again, this was the original goal of the first wave of AI researchers. The goal was to create an artificial intelligence, a machine that was basically indistinguishable from a human. Once again, Alan Turing believed you could gauge whether or not you arrived at this goal if the machine successfully passes the Turing test with a high success rate. And for those of you that don't know, the Turing test is the famous litmus test of AI that Alan Turing believed was an elegant and sufficient way to determine whether a computer scientist had succeeded in creating strong AI. The Turing test stated if a person speaking with the computer through text was fooled, and could not tell he was talking to a computer and not a human being, then Turing proposed that you could not deny that the machine was exhibiting human level intelligence. Now, we are going to discuss the Turing test in a later episode because there are all sorts of fallacies embedded within this criterion. But suffice to say for now, in the words of the former head of the computer science department at University of Oxford, Michael Wooldridge, in his book, A Brief History of Artificial Intelligence, modern day AI researchers no longer see the Turing test as a serious criterion to design towards and strong AI is now, quote, largely irrelevant, end quote. Rather, the bulk of AI research today centers on the development of weak or narrow AI, which are various tightly scoped computer programs that focuses on just one basic task like playing chess or trying to determine whether a tumor is present in a CT scan. In the AI course I took as part of my systems engineering master's program, there was no attempt to ever even try to build strong AI. Rather, my final project was to train what is known as a deep reinforcement learning agent to solve a very specific task of trying to balance an upright pole sitting on a cart on a frictionless surface. But note a couple important facts. First, I, the human, was the one programming the agent. I was the one that set up its training environment and gave it very specific instructions on how it was to learn that environment. I was the one that set up the computer's so-called hyperparameters that controlled how it was going to learn. 
the so-called artificially intelligent agent was actually anything but. There was no sentience, no understanding, no real learning in the way we understand the term. My algorithm was and always will be simply electrical ones and zeros. Now, it needs to be emphasized once again, the original dream of strong AI recreating the human mind in a machine is all but dead. As admitted by computer engineering professor Danny Crooks of Queen's University Belfast, quote, we are still a long, long way from creating real human-like intelligence. People have been fooled by the impact of data-driven computing into thinking that we are approaching the level of human intelligence, but in my opinion, we are nowhere near it. Indeed, it might be argued that progress in real AI in recent years has actually slowed down. There is probably less research into real AI now than ever before, end quote. Michael Wooldridge elaborates and concurs, quote, go to a contemporary AI conference and you will hear almost nothing about strong AI except possibly late at night in the bar, end quote. But this brings us to a startling conclusion. If the notion of strong AI the original concept by Alan Turing and John McCarthy of building artificial minds is all but dead, then it follows that in reality, artificial intelligence itself is all but dead. And so, what serious computer scientists at places like Google, OpenAI, and Microsoft are left developing today is not actually artificial intelligence at all. All they are making, all weak AI is, is computer programs. The term artificial intelligence is an obsolete holdover from the 1950s. Whenever you hear the word AI, you can simply replace it with the word computer program and you'll get a much clearer sense of what is being done. In a very real sense, all applications of weak AI, as impressive as they may be, are, at its core, a glorified pocket calculator. Now, let's get a little bit technical for a moment and I'll explain. As I just stated, weak AI is really just a computer program. But unlike computer programs in the past, where a programmer would painstakingly write every line of instruction a machine is supposed to slavishly obey, written in a special language the machine can understand, like C++, the reason AI has become such a hot and trending topic recently is because today's computer programs, thanks to much more powerful processors and huge amounts of data, can finally implement a very old idea called machine learning. Now, what is machine learning? In the words of AI pioneer Arthur Samuel, machine learning is, quote, the field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without explicitly being programmed, end quote. Now, here's the thing. In the AI field, you need to recognize that simple sounding terms like learning or training or search does not mean what you think it means. These are actually technical jargon that doesn't have the same colloquial definition. When a machine learning algorithm is stated to be learning, it is not in the sense of a human being learning, through our God-given abilities like understanding or reasoning with intellect. When a computer program is said to be learning, what is happening is the computer program is still ultimately following the instructions of the human computer programmer. But the instructions are now indirect. Rather than the programmer writing line by line the exact steps the computer is supposed to take to produce some output, 
A machine learning computer program is instead given a huge set of examples of what the programmer wants and then through some programmer defined learning process, the program iteratively gets better and better at spitting out an output that looks a lot like the examples it was shown. But note, the human designer is still the one ultimately in charge. The programmer is still the one defining the task. The programmer is the one thinking and perceiving and understanding. The programmer is the one that is self-aware and is striving to achieve some goal, not the program. Now, we can make the programmer even more indirectly involved in the process. We can implement a specific approach to machine learning called deep learning, which uses a learning architecture called neural networks. A neural network, as the name implies, is supposed to mimic the structure of the brain and is comprised of individual neurons, represented by ovals in this picture, connected to each other. And what these neurons do is take in some raw input data, so for ChatGPT, which is a deep learning model that uses neural networks, the inputs are a wide variety of text. These neurons take in the text, applies a little bit of math to it, and then spits out an answer that it passes to the next neuron, which takes in that answer, applies math again, spits out a new answer, passes that to the next neuron, and so on. Now, here's the part of neural networks that freak people out into thinking we are going to accidentally develop a self-aware Skynet or something from Terminator. The math part that neurons perform is what is known as an opaque process, which is why neural networks are considered black box models. And what that terminology means is that we can't really understand the details of why a deep learning computer program is doing the math that it does on the way to it obeying our instructions and giving us the final answer we want, specifically what are known as the weights associated with each neural connection. And this is largely because for a deep learning model, we are often talking about millions of neurons with several millions of connections and then further abstracted to multiple layers. So the fact that it is very difficult to understand what exactly is going on inside a neural network once we hit the go button on it is what causes the media and AI lay people to jump to the unwarranted conclusion that these ovals and lines are a rudimentary version of human thought that will only grow exponentially more sophisticated with further scientific progress and eventually you have HAL 9000 enslaving humanity. But no one knowledgeable in the field creating even the most advanced deep learning computer programs like ChatGPT that make use of the most elaborate neural networks and gigantic training sets are even pretending that these programs are exhibiting real intelligence or understanding. The human programmer is still the one directing the entire show. They are now two or three steps removed from the process. They're no longer dictating what the computer should do step by step explicitly. But at the root of the whole model, a person is still issuing instructions to a machine just like the pocket calculator. And so the notion of creating intelligence is no longer relevant to anything so-called AI researchers are producing today, yet the term has simply stuck around due to the twists and turns of its evolving history, which has unfortunately only served to confuse and cause the occasional panic, usually among those not actually knowledgeable of the field, people like futurists. You see, the original idea of artificial intelligence, what we specify as strong or general AI today, is built on the foundations of atheism, Darwinian evolution, and an old earth of multiple billions of years. And the unbelieving futurist logic goes as follows. If the creator God does not exist, and 
if the material world is all that exists, and if intelligent human life arose by the unguided and therefore extremely slow process of species evolution, then it follows that we humans can oversee a guided and therefore much faster process of technological evolution and create human-like machine intelligence. Inspect any futurist screed or doomsday philosopher prophecy hyperventilating about the imminent invention of strong AI, you will always find at its root the same fallacious three-legged stool of atheism, evolution, and billions of years. Let's hear from futurist Nick Bostrom, author of 2016 book, Superintelligence, Paths, Dangers, and Strategies. I work with a bunch of uh, mathematicians, philosophers, and computer scientists, and um, we sit around and think uh, about the future of machine intelligence, among other things. If we think about it, we are actually recently arrived guests on this planet. The human species, well, like, think about if the world, like, was created, Earth was created one year ago. The human species then would be 10 minutes old. Ask ourselves, what is the cause of this current anomaly? Some people would say it's technology. Um, but I like to think back further to the ultimate cause. Um, look at these two highly distinguished gentlemen. If we look under the hood, this is what we find. Basically the same thing. Right? One is a little larger. It maybe also has a few tricks in the exact way it's wired. These invisible differences cannot be too complicated, however, because there have only been 250,000 generations since our last common ancestor, and we know that complicated mechanisms take a long time to evolve. And here is, once again, Yuval Noah Harari espousing the same erroneous three-legged stool that undergirds the strong AI mythology. Actually, AI will probably change the very meaning of the ecological system. Because for four billion years, the ecological system of planet Earth contained only organic life forms. And now, or soon, we might see the emergence of the first inorganic life forms. Gods are also not a biological or physical reality. Gods, too, is something that we humans have created with language by telling legends and writing scriptures. If I think about it in kind of evolutionary terms, so AI now just crawled out of the organic soup like the first organisms that crawled out of the organic soup four billion years ago. The thing about digital evolution, it's moving on a completely different time scale than organic evolution. The notion of human-level machine intelligence sits on top of this three-legged stool which is why every futurist and believer in the future possibility of strong AI will parrot these three unproven assumptions. But like a three-legged stool, as soon as one of these legs is removed, the entire edifice will fall. The concept of a thinking machine will crumble. Let's consider the first leg. If atheism isn't true, then the human mind is not just a lump of atoms and molecules that were randomly mashed together, which we humans can reverse engineer and even improve by our own knowledge. Rather, the existence of the creator God of the Bible means man is not in his core essence mere material, but a carrier of the spark of the divine. The Bible says in Genesis 1 verses 26 to 27 that man is a creature made in God's image. And though we are made from material, what Genesis 2-7 calls the dust from the ground, we are not only dust. We also possess an immaterial soul as God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. It is this immaterial part, the breath of God, that Scripture states turned the dust into the living creature Adam. It is because of Adam's soul, not his composition of dust, that God's word describes Adam as an intelligent creature that was able to work and maintain the Garden of Eden in Genesis 2.15, 
understand language in verse 16, make hypothetical forecasts about the future, namely his demise if he were to violate God's command to not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in verse 17, creatively classify all the myriad livestock and birds and beasts God made in verses 19 to 20. Feel the emotional pangs of loneliness in verse 18. Cry out with joy, beholding God's provision of a wife in verse 23. And most importantly of all, make the willful decision to either worship or disobey his creator in Genesis chapter 3. Psalm 19 verse 1 declares, quote, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork, end quote. Romans 1, 19-20 states the existence and attributes of the Almighty Creator is self-evident to all by merely looking at any aspect of the world. When we behold the perfectly balanced composition of the Earth's atmosphere, the existence of a magnetosphere to shield us from harmful radiation, the intricate mathematical patterns formed by a seashell, the incredibly sophisticated self-regulating power plant inside our body's cells called mitochondrion. There can be no honest denial of the existence of God. In the words of Psalm chapter 14, verse 1, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. But the AI futurist must believe this foolish lie because if there is a God, then the human mind is a miracle. And if the human mind is a miracle, we will never be able to replicate it. The second and third legs of the strong AI three-legged stool, evolution and billions of years go together and in fact follow from the first leg. If there is no God, how do we explain the origin of life? For most of human history, haters of God of the Bible did not so much deny God's existence altogether, but rather simply posited the existence of a different God, not a holy God, not a God that rightfully has lordship over his creatures made in his image, but rather a God made in the image of man. These are the hundreds and thousands of false religions civilizations have invented through the ages, idols made of wood, stone, silver, and gold, high places during the time of the Israelites, Asherim, the Roman pantheon, Zeus, Jupiter, Juno, Mars, Allah, the Jehovah's Witnesses God, the God of money, success, and fame by televangelists. Men knew in their hearts that attempting to explain the existence of even an inanimate tree without invoking some kind of divine figure was too ridiculous that was until the invention of a clever fairy tale called Darwinian evolution. Militant atheist Richard Dawkins wrote in his 1991 book, The Blind Watchmaker, a very revealing confession that it was Darwin that made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. And in this, Dawkins spoke better than he knew as it was, indeed, Darwin's evolutionary hypothesis that singularly provided God deniers a veneer of intellectual credibility. But make no mistake, the veneer of intellectual credibility is thin. The problems with Darwinism is legion. Where did the universe come from? How does non-existence give birth to existence? Where is the evidence non-life can spontaneously produce life? Why has no evolutionist been able to give an answer to this simple question? Can you give an example of a genetic mutation or, 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 or an evolutionary process which ha can be seen to increase the information in the genome? Can you just stop Who precisely fine-tuned the fundamental constants of the universe and the parameters of the planet Earth to exactly support life? How can something as relatively simple as an eyeball form from random processes when it would need to have been developed all at once as each component floating on its own would confer no survival advantage? 
Why is it, in the words of William Paley, when we see a wristwatch in the middle of a field, everyone, everywhere, will always immediately know the watch was made by a watchmaker, yet when we see any biological entity that is millions of times more complex, suddenly it's the result of random chance. These unanswered questions merely scratch the surface of the atheist evolutionist's problems. So unlikely is the proposal that the complexity of life arose from random chance, neo-Darwinists are forced to shoehorn in the claim that the universe existed for multiple billions of years, the logic being, of course, even something astronomically improbable, given enough time, will eventually happen. But there persists a twofold problem. First, returning to the question of the formation of the eye, a structure that had to appear all at once, the essential problem of Darwinism isn't a matter of low probabilities, a problem that can perhaps be overcome with enough rolls of the dice, the problem is no probabilities. Evolution is simply logically wrong. Mutations do not create more genetic information. Speciation, the formation of new kinds of creatures after millions of gradual mutations from another kind of creature simply cannot occur. But the second and most important problem is that the inerrant perfect word of God explicitly denies evolution and an old earth. There is no honest exegetical way of reading the book of Genesis and seeing the three legs of strong AI. Grammatically and contextually, Genesis 1 is written as a plain and ordinary historical record of the creation of the world in six literal 24-hour days. Different kinds of sea, land, and air creatures were made at once, and death, which is a prerequisite for evolution's mechanism of survival of the fittest, did not exist until humanity fell into sin in Genesis 3. Even accounting for gaps in the biblical genealogical record of the patriarchs, the total age of the universe would be in the thousands, not billions of years. Undoubtedly, none of what I just stated is convincing if your starting point is your own wisdom rather than God's. But for those of you I am primarily speaking to, Christians that believe in the Word of God by the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit living inside you, consider one of the strongest arguments against evolution and an old earth. No Christian would have interpreted Genesis 1 in such a manner until 1859 with the publication of Darwin's On the Origin of Species. A believer that fears the world's mockery to such an extent that he reads strong AI's three-legged stool into the text of Scripture is to imply every believer until the 19th century did not understand the book of Genesis, which is both an absurd and also disrespectful claim against our family in Christ. By the way, for more help debunking the false teaching of evolution in an old earth, two resources I can't recommend highly enough is the Answers in Genesis ministry and the Battle for the Beginning sermon series and book by John MacArthur, and links for both will be in the description below. Ultimately, the anxiety concerning a super intelligence or general or strong AI is based on layers of unbiblical presuppositions which make the preposterous claim that men and women made in God's image are nothing more than just accidentally arranged stuff. But the truth is, in spite of futurists and non-believers professing with their lips to believe this, no one actually lives as if it's true. Yuval Noah Harari undoubtedly loves his friends and family and would bristle at the notion that their existence or happiness is just a matter of deterministic molecular processes. Ray Kurzweil, self-proclaimed agnostic, lives 
as if there are moral rights and wrongs in spite of the fact that without the God of the Bible, there can be no foundation for objective morality. And so, AI futurism, far from a scientific or valid pursuit of truth, is actually a fantastical, anti-Christian religion that has little to no overlap with actual computer science as it is being researched and developed today. Yet, because of the holdover of the AI label, AI, the futurist philosophy, and AI, the actual science, are frequently conflated. But make no mistake, machines will never think because machines do not have the breath of God. We will never create Skynet. We will never create HAL 9000. Now, does that mean advanced computer programs pose absolutely no threats to society? Not at all. There are very real potential dangers modern day computers and really all kinds of technological progress present. But worrying about a singularity confuses and distracts from these real issues that absolutely need to be identified and discussed. But that will be a future episode. If you don't want to miss it, please consider subscribing to the channel and thank you for joining me today on Modern Dogma. All our links can be found at moderndogma.com. Men err, God is sovereign.